Welcome to Fairman Radio. I am your host Aga Pokrywka and my guest today is feminist scientist Debolina Roy. Debolina is a senior associate dean of faculty at Emory College of Arts and Science in Atlanta, Georgia in the US. Debolina researches and teaches neuroscience, molecular biology, feminist science and technology studies, feminist theory, post-colonial studies and reproductive justice movements. She is especially interested in developing feminist practices and how they can be put in practice in the lab. She is perhaps best known as the author of Molecular Feminisms, Biology Becomings and Life in the Lab. In this book she proposes new connections and communications that can emerge between molecular biology and feminisms. So thank you so much, uh, Debolina, that you found uh, a moment to talk here to us on Fairman Radio. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, have you here. You are a feminist scientist. Could you describe what is feminist criticism of science? I think that, um, you know, for many kind of social justice oriented um, practices, Feminism is one of them. And the way that most people will kind of um, know about feminism or think about feminism is that this idea that women and men should be treated equally. And of course, that's at the heart of much of feminist movements, just asking to be treated equally. Um, But I think that feminism actually goes a little bit beyond that. It, to me, has represented kind of like a a toolkit to think about not just equality, but to think about difference. So my way of thinking about feminism is that it allows me to think about other issues, including, for example, race, class, sexuality, ability, just any kind of, um, you know, marker that we've placed in our society that puts some people aside or marks them as different, different or other, that we can use the toolkits of this kind of political movement of feminism to think about difference. Um, and so I've brought this skill set with me into um, how I think about science and the scientific experimentation that I do. Um, and because it's in mostly in molecular biology that I was trained how we think about difference in our bodies, in in molecules, um, actually matters. You know, we treat something as a, a, a mutation uh, in order to study like the normal. So, uh, to me, feminism, a feminist science, means that we expand our understandings of how to encounter difference, um, and then what we do with the meanings that we place on that difference. Do I remember well that actually you made your bachelor studies in microbiology? Yes. Since we are talking here on Fairman Radio, um, and Fairman Radio is mostly into micro world and bacteria and how invisible impacts our lives. I wonder if we could talk also about how, for example, approach to microbiology. Mm-hmm. How the approach to those biologies, let's say, um, changes if approached with a feminist thought? Do we change the methods we work with? Do we gather different data or the ethics are Okay, changing? so I, I hear like multiple layers in that um, question. It's a really great question. Um, so maybe where I'll begin is like what has drawn me to microbiology and to molecular biology. and um, uh, I think I've always just been interested in uh, like the world that we as humans occupy and that it's, our world is beyond us. And I think, I, you know, I, I do mention this in, in my book where I had this encounter. Um, I was pulling grass out of, out of the ground and my grandmother who had, was staying with us, who was from India, was watching me do this and said, Devlina, why are you you know, tearing out the grass, they have lives too, you know, they, they deserve to live. And I remember that, you know, that comment she made to me when I was just a kid that, yeah, uh, there's life around us and we're not the only ones. And so 
kind of trying to uh, appreciate and bring myself to kind of a, a plane of existence where I was closer to the non-human was became like a goal. It became a way to encounter my day as a kid. And so I think it be, it was a natural step that I would uh, be interested in microbiology uh, to do my undergrad. I wanted to know more about non-human organisms. And um, the road from from the micro to the molecular was a very easy kind of you know, path, because once you study uh, microorganisms, you realize there's a world within the microorganism. And so uh, and it's funny that I'm saying this because, you know, I have a I have a daughter who has this love ever since she was little of everything tiny. And I don't know if you've heard about this uh, movement, but it's um, people who make like tiny little things or tiny houses or and they call them mini acts. So my daughter is a miniac. Everything that she likes to build, and she she's always working with her hands, or is always kind of the tiny. And I'm starting to think maybe she, I rubbed off her, on her in some way that I've also been attracted to the worlds um, that we can't see uh, or that we, you know, we easily forget exist. Um, and this is maybe part of the it's the attention that we need to give to the non-human. And as a kid, I would not know these terms, but what more recently would be kind of realized, you know, um, realized as a, like a post-humanist orientation to the world. Let me go back to the question that you've asked about how can a feminist approach to studying microbiology, like, what is that? What, what makes it different or molecular biology for that matter? So I think in that idea that I put, you know, ahead, uh, before that feminism for me kind of, um, allows me to reorient the understanding we bring to difference. And so that actually uh, is, is an ethical orientation in, in many ways. And it makes you encounter what it is that you want to know in a different way. I think much of, you know, science um, and, you know, particularly new biotechnologies are, are really kind of extractive technologies, extractive knowledge, uh, where we as scientists are supposed to have an object in front of us. We extract whatever resources, material, and knowledge we can, and then we use it for our own means. I think that a feminist approach for not all feminist scientists, but I think the feminism that I um, think about would have the scientists reorient themselves to that so-called object of knowledge. And that division right there between the subject and object is where that feminist practice begins. Um, that you come to realize that you cannot distance yourself as a knower from what it is that's going to become the known. And um, so that you think about, you know, organisms differently. And the example I would give here, it's a great example that I, you know, when I first started reading some um, kind of philosophy of science and feminist philosophy of science, I came across Evelyn Fox Keller's work, who uh, wrote about Barbara McClintock's work. And Barbara McClintock was a, a, a cytogenicist who looked at chromosomes, and particularly in maize, in corn. And Barbara McClintock had dedicated her life to observing, you know, how chromosomes um, do their work in this organism. And uh, in the book, A Feeling for the Organism, Emma Fox Keller describes Barbara McClintock's kind of work, that she would stare into the microscope for hours and hours on end, and she would become one and she, with the chromosomes that she could see herself wandering within the chromosomes. And it was because of that close, intimate connection and not that difference between the knower and the known, but rather this kind of engagement and attachment, a type of partnership that McClintock was able to witness what you know is now described as the jumping genes or the transposition of genes at the cytogenic level. 
right? So that's an example of, you know, a different type of orientation as a scientist to your object of, of study. Um, another example that would be more microbiology related is the work of Lynn Margulis, for example, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, but this idea also that, you know, um, the uh, dominant paradigms and metaphors that we carry with us around the world uh, makes its way into how we come to know the world and define that world. Evolution uh, need not be this kind of uh, battle and struggle, you know, for the fittest, for, you know, um, but rather uh, this kind of mode of cooperation and uh, what she termed as symbiogenesis. So, you know, these were examples that, you know, I came to know early in my work when I started calling myself a feminist scientist, that this is the approach to science that I've been after. I just didn't know the names of it when I was, you know, a student. I'm also thinking about the taxonomy and how microorganisms, for example, are placed there and also other species, of course. And uh, the taxonomy was uh, created in a particular time in a history by a person from the particular part of the world. Mm -hmm. What do you think if we would need to rebuild the taxonomy uh, with feminist uh, approach uh, in our methods? Mm -hmm. Could we brainstorm here how it yeah. would look? What a great question. Um, I love that you pointed out that, you know, taxonomy itself as a kind of, uh, it's the birth in many ways of modern Western, so-called Western practice of science, right? It came from a certain place. Like, let's just name it. So Carl Linnaeus, he is known as kind of the, you know, the first person to create this system of knowing the world. But thinking about how we come to know the world in this case is that like, who has the um, privilege or who thinks that they have it within them to go around and name and divide up the world and to, you know, to put, put um, nature, not only to name it, but then to also put it in a certain place. Yeah, and give a hierarchy to it, right? Right, right. So, so this is also the important thing. So I'm not against naming things, but um, it is important that we think about the ontological uh, impact and residue that occurs when we see the world through taxonomy. Because if it's in the shape of a tree, um, then we see that there are things that are, uh, and this arboreal thought that, you know, um, the losing guitar kind of tell us to think um, in a different way from that, that something becomes central. And then there are the, you know, the branches that are not maybe thought of as being as um, central, you know, so I'm not against naming. It's just the, rather, how do we um, orient our relationship once we've brought things into the world and name them in a, maybe a hierarchical fashion, right? Instead of, you know, thinking about a hierarchy, we could instead think about um, what, once again, Deleuze and Guattari would have us think about is rhizomatic thought, right? Is, is that there is not one center necessarily, but rather we're all uh, connected and engaged with each other and constantly moving and changing. What taxonomy, classical taxonomy does is that it kind of draws a line that this is where, you know, um, uh, evolution kind of came to a point and now we can pause it here. Um, and it, it, it creates this idea of fixity that I think, um, or, or being, which I'm interested in thinking rather in terms of becoming and change. And I'm not the only one, you know, there are so many, like Lynn Margulis, for example, who talks about bacterial sex. It's all about the capability to change constantly. So what taxonomy kind of does is it, it places this false ontological framework of being, and then it, it, it makes everything kind of static. My, my idea, once again, about thinking of difference differently is uh, that our, our beings are in flux, that we're constantly in this motion of becoming. So taxonomy um, 
although it can, you know, be useful in some spaces, should not be the only way that we come to see the world. I guess this is this is also about questioning objectivity of science because many of the scientific research want to appear as kind of uh, objective and this is how it is. But then at the end, there are people behind this research and uh, they have a particular background stories, origin, which impacts how those uh, scientific truths are phrased, right? And yeah, you're right. There is a link here between how we think of taxonomy and who had the right to do the naming and how we think about scientific objectivity. So, the, you know, very early on, I, I read about the story of Sarah Bartman, and um, who was called the hot and tot Venus. And this would have been, you know, early 1800s. You have, um, you know, this birth of taxonomy and naming and trying to get to know the world through like these um, European naturalists such, such as George Cuvier. So when I realized that, you know, our practices have not only, like the object isn't just the non-human, the object is also the human, that we can distance ourselves so much from another human to think that to the point where we question whether they are human or not. And that's what, you know, the scientists did with Sarah Bartman because of her differences um, in her, uh, in the color of her skin, the very fact that she was a female, um, and also that, you know, parts of her body were deemed as kind of too far from the European mentality to even be thought of as human. This othering that happened to many people and groups around the world and continues to this day. How molecular biology researches on microbes? Well, molecular biology wouldn't exist without microbiology. So um, without bacteria, for example, or without yeast, for example, we wouldn't have any of the techniques uh, in microbiology that have, in molecular biology that have taught us about the world. So for example, you know, this whole idea of genetic engineering or recombinant DNA technologies, they form the basis of molecular biology. And something like recombinant DNA technologies comes from the very fact that bacteria have been doing this forever. You know, so, you know, in the book, I talk about um, uh, bacterial lives. Uh, and, you know, so this kind of jumping of genes or transposition or bacterial sex, as Lynn Margulis talks about, is really about adaptation. It's really about the mixing of genetic materials between, you know, other kinds of organisms that in fact sometimes come together to form a bacteria. So the, the, the um, exchange of genetic material, bacteria have been doing this from the get-go. And we as molecular biologists have taken the skill sets that bacteria have and we use it ourselves. So in any molecular biology lab, any given day, there are E. coli definitely uh, doing all the labor of, uh, you know, taking, multiplying genes um, and producing the proteins that, you know, molecular biologists are looking at. Maybe it's worthy to mention here the, the title of the book you are referring to. It's uh, Molecular Feminism's Biology Becomings and Life in the Lab, right? It's actually accessible online for free, which is so great. The book is published by University of Washington Press in their um, series uh, that they have on fe feminist technosciences. Uh, but because I'm also faculty here at Emory University, um, the university has a, a Mellon Foundation grant that is trying to uh, create open access monographs and um, particularly interdisciplinary monographs to make them available for the multiple audiences. And so I jumped at the chance of having uh, the book as open access because of also my commitment to kind of the democratization of knowledge that everybody, you know, should have access to this. And in fact, it should be, um, you know, critiqued by people who are uh, experts in other worlds other than just in the halls of academia. Would you be able to tell us 
what we can learn, for example, from, from the things, whether those are molecular objects or uh, micro uh, organisms, uh, what can we learn from, from those? Maybe the biggest lesson is uh, humility, actually. And that's uh, like an ethical orientation that um, a lot of scientists, I think, already have. But it's not encouraged. It's it's a type of humility that when you are in involved in that encounter with what it is that you want to know, that you can admit that you're being touched by that encounter. It's not simply you uh, extracting knowledge and going away, but that you're actually also um, changed by that encounter. It's about, so that's the ethical part of it, I suppose. It's about a ontological reorientation that you can see that this tiny little microscopic molecular uh, actant is actually p- causing a push and pull, pull on the world. And who is to say that that push and pull is any less significant than what we as humans are doing? Um, so there's this kind of like ontological, like reframing that can happen that changeability is actually this really important skill that microbes and molecules, um, already know and, and do this. And so when you're a scientist, you know, understanding or trying to understand, you know, how a molecule works, if you just simply identify the molecule that's not enough you need to know like what is that molecule doing how is it being changed what is it changing and that's actually the scientific inquiry right um and i think uh scientists know this but it's not the type of language or it's not the type of um way that we communicate our knowledge of the world I guess that it's also not just about uh, investigating or watching, but also about kinships between, for example, bacteria and a human, so we can better understand the process of becoming. I guess it's also quite aligned with, or at least how I understand what you try to convey in your book. Actually, you summarized it better than I have. That's, that's, That's exactly right. So what I mean by, you know, that we are being also touched by what it is that we think we're studying or we're coming to know, that is exactly it. It's it's about a um, an acknowledgement of kinship um, that exists, uh, you know, because without bacteria, there would be absolutely no humans. So unless we get that through our heads, um, you know, we're not going to be able to make it through. And we can understand what's going on right now in a pandemic, right? How we've oriented ourselves to thinking what a virus is, um, has allowed us to only think about what to do with that virus or how to get rid of that virus, uh, you know, like what it does for humans. And if we were to kind of uh, destabilize the centrality of humans for a moment, maybe at this point we would have known more about how viruses operate and what we can do to still create a, like a healthy environment for all kinds of creatures, not just human, so that this wouldn't have been propagated, you know, the virus as it is right now. Definitely. What are what are the scientists, or maybe even beyond science, whom basically we should check out in the field of uh, feminism and science? Yeah. I mean, the book is really kind of um, geared, uh, and, and it takes from a lot of feminist theory, and feminist science studies, but I will say that the biggest impacts about thinking of the world in a different way and with uh, biology or, or becoming a scientist um, with a different type of orientation, for me, it does come from a post-colonial critique of science and a post-colonial engagement with science studies. And um, and once again, you know, um, I learned about uh, this work before I, I I became an interdisciplinary scholar. My parents are from India um, and they're from this, uh, you know, the region called Bengal. And so we have, you know, growing up, uh, my parents in Canada, they made sure that, you know, we learned 
as much as we could about India. And and they grew up. Uh, my parents were both born while the British were still um, in India. So there was a, a, a different kind of, I think, orientation to thinking about colonialism. And definitely, uh, you know, they came to to their own adulthood in this post-colonial era. So I think that kind of had an effect on me. And so they, they were very proud when they shared, for example, the work of uh, Jagadish Chandra Bose, who um, is a, uh, was a Bengali, uh, well, we would call him a biophysicist now, but um, J.C. Bose actually um, was working at a time in colonial India uh, where he was trying to understand uh, responses in non-humans and particularly in plants. And he was able to uh, demonstrate through these kind of scientific means of plant sentience. And that, you know, when a, when a plant was beside another plant, if you destroyed one plant, the other plant would actually respond. They would share the story with me of J.C. John, you know, J.C. Bose's work, and that had a really big impact on me. And in fact, there's this fantastic film that's based on a, a, a soundtrack by Stevie Wonder. So I came to J.C. J.C. Bose's work through um, my love for Stevie Wonder. So Stevie Wonder had this album, The Secret Life of Plants, and they there was a film made out of it that included. Uh, J.C. Bose's work. And I thought, you know what? Um, J.C. Bose showed us that you can do a type of science that is not harmful to the environment, that actually wants to know more about that that so-called object of knowledge in a way that appreciates what that knowledge has to, what that organism has to offer. Um, and what was also really interesting I learned about J.C. Bose is that he didn't want to patent his um, scientific, you know, uh, tools or his discovery. He didn't think that a scientist or as a human, we could own nature or own the knowledge that nature has. And so that orientation, like, um, and, you know, way to become a scientist really had an impact on me. Um, and then uh, I talk about another um, uh, intellectual scholar, poet from India, and that's uh, Ramindranath Tagore. Um, and uh, he, Tagore won a Nobel Prize in literature um, in the early 1900s. And uh, my family, my, you know, my parents, they made sure that I um, learned Bengali as a kid growing up. And part of that was exposing me to the the music and the the literature by Tagore. And uh, Tagore also talked a lot about um, humans as being just one in this kind of massive universe of, of um, identities and um, players and actants, you know? And so he would treat, for example, a blade of grass with as much importance and give that, give that blade of grass the space to kind of be the communicator of desire, be the communicator of, and, and teacher for us humans of like how we need to be with the world. Um, same thing with like, you know, a ray of sunshine. So he was always talking about nature in this way that elevated the status um, that was not in this kind of great chain of being mode or this, you know, taxonomy mode uh, of looking at the world. When you look at the world with, uh, I don't know, whatever tools we got there, microscopes, they can uh, bring us closer to the object we observe. That also those differences between biological species, they suddenly disappear or change into something else, right? So something which uh, becomes a judgment, how, for example, we perceive uh, people and their differences under the microscope, they are gone. Right, right. Um, and it's interesting, and this is where, you know, a lot of feminist science scholarship has definitely, you know, had a huge role on me. So, you know, uh, when I did try to start making that shift into women's studies um, and philosophy of science, you know, some of the most important texts that I came across were those of um, Sandra Harding, Londa Scheibinger, Nancy Tuana, 
Um, and then also the work of Karen Barad, of course, and Donna Haraway. You know, my whole point um, as a feminist scientist has not been just to leave that um, that encounter with science with the mode of critique, but then what do we do with those critiques? And how do we try to learn about the world differently and continue with the science, right? But, you know, continue in it in a different way. So, you know, what you're saying that the distance that's created between humans and the differences kind of can disappear underneath that microscope. Um, that is absolutely true. And um, I think that there's a really important message there. Um, to be able to recognize that those dis differences can disappear. But what we as molecular biologists do, um, or as scientists, is that we're constantly chasing that difference so that we can place our finger on it and then do something with that. You know, whether we're trying to create a drug or we're trying to establish, you know, um, or provide more evidence for some kind of, you know, claim that in many ways, if we're talking about humans and differences, does lead to some kind of like inequality um, and bolstering inequal, uh, inequal practices. So my, my whole idea actually is not to erase difference. Like there is something beautiful about looking into that microscope and things kind of disappearing, but it's not just about erasing the difference, but in fact, treating that difference and that multiplicity in this new kind of light and not in kind of a hierarchical mode but more in this imminent kind of plane i could go on for for another hour with you this has been wonderful yes i enjoyed it so much thank you so much aga i hope that we can uh connect um and see each other uh at another time that was debolina roy you can follow her twitter account at debolina underscore roy This episode continues a series on Ferment Radio that focuses entirely on feminist issues. It's a sisterhood act of solidarity with Polish women's disagreement with a law that prohibits abortion in Poland. If you would like to know more about the show, listen to this episode again or find previous episodes, please go to fermentradio.com. You can subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and more. Fairman Radio is brought to you by Culture of Cultures and is produced by Super Eclectic. Thank you for listening. Keep fermenting and stay tuned for the next episode of Fairman Radio.